We'll get right into our conversation after a word from our sponsors. If you're ready for an epic family vacation this summer, there's no better place than sunny Orlando. Exciting thrills, never-ending food festivals, fresh new dining experiences, outdoor adventures in Florida's unique natural springs, and so much more. Orlando has it all. Our Visit Orlando vacation planners can help you plan the perfect trip. In Orlando, anything is possible, if you can imagine it. And that's what makes Orlando unbelievably real. Plan your escape today at visitorlando.com. Can we talk about me time? Who wants to be interrupted while streaming a podcast by a spam call offering free car warranty? Nobody I know. With AT&T Active Armor, customers can enjoy their me time with no interruptions. It helps block spam calls and provides strong mobile security. Just head to your app store and simply download the Active Armor app for free because you deserve more me time. Learn how AT&T customers can download Active Armor for free to help block spam calls and strengthen mobile security. Requires compatible device and service. Data charges may apply. May block wanted calls. Restrictions apply. Visit att.com slash Active Armor app for details. Picture it. A guy walks in after a long day of work. His wife glances up from her book and asks, which Hyundai are we driving into the city for date night? She begins her case for the all-new Ionic 6. One word, style. Her husband pushes for the bold and sleek design of the Ionic 5. His word, showstopper. Both warrant the OK Hyundai nod. Which one are you choosing? Visit HyundaiUSA.com to learn more about the all-electric Hyundai Ionic 5 and Hyundai Ionic 6. Extremely limited availability. 2023 Ionic 5 and 2023 Ionic 6 are available in limited quantities at select dealers in select states only. Contact your Hyundai dealer for availability details. This week, we have a special episode for you, very near and dear to my heart and dedicated to the beautiful bonds of sisterhood. Many of you know that my debut book, Sisterhood Heals, The Transformative Power of Healing in Community, releases on June 27th. It is a celebration of and a guide to the relationships Black women have with one another. Well, the TBG team got some very early copies of the book and had a little book club of their own to chat about their thoughts, musings, and praise for Sisterhood Heals. And we wanted to share it with you. But the conversation won't stop here. I want you to be a part of it as well. So please pre-order your copy at SisterhoodHeals.com so that you'll be able to join in the fun as well. If something resonates with you while enjoying our conversation, please share it with us on social media using the hashtag TBG in session and Sisterhood Heals. Or join us in the Sister Circle to talk more about the episode at community.therapyforblackgirls.com. Here's our conversation from our book club to yours. Hello, I'm Frida Lucas. I'm the senior producer here at the Therapy for Black Girls podcast, and I have the distinct honor to be in conversation with my fellow team members here at Therapy for Black Girls to discuss Sisterhood Heals, the upcoming book and the first book from our illustrious leader and founder of Therapy for Black Girls, Dr. Joy Harden Bradford. And I can speak for myself, have had such an incredible joy reading this book and now being in conversation with you all. So I'm very, very excited for us to get started. Before we jump in talking about Sisterhood Heals, I would love to pass it over to the team to do introductions. And the first person I'm going to ask to do introductions is Naisha. Hello, I'm super excited to be joining you all today. I'm Naisha and I am the community assistant with the Therapy for Black Girls Sister Circle. I love what I do with our community, and I'm just feeling warm and fuzzy after going through my notes, just, you know, ready to dive in. Let's pass it over to Kia. Hi, my name is Kia, and I'm the business manager here at Therapy for Black Girls, so I try to coordinate and make sure that the team is working as effectively and efficiently as possible, and I, too, am excited to discuss this book because it reminded me of some things that I had already experienced in life and some things that I'm looking forward to implementing, so Can't wait to get into it. And the one and only Gorgeous. Hello, everyone. My name is Gorgeous. I'm a content specialist with the team with Therapy for Black Girls. I help in the community on Facebook, as well as help pitch topics and things to discuss on the podcast and blog. And last, but most certainly not least, Elise. Hey, everyone. I'm Elise Ellis, the producer of the Therapy for Black Girls podcast. 
I am so excited to discuss Sisterhood Heals today. I absolutely love this book and I'm really proud of Dr. Joy. And in preparing for this conversation, I was thinking about chapter three, being your sister's keeper and being soft places to land for each other. And I think that's what we have here at this team. It's just so heartwarming to discuss it with you guys. I'm excited to see how the sister circle talks about the book and just our entire audience's response to the release. All right, Elise, let's kick it off with these conversation questions. Yeah. So I already talked a little bit about one of my favorite parts of the book, chapter three, about being your sister's keeper. And I'm curious what sections of the book stood out to you guys and why? Global sisterhood definitely just brung joy because I'm like, yes, this is how you can help a sister. But then going into the four S's of sisterhood, being seen, supported, and supporting ourselves as well as soften. Wow. Just breaking that down so we can understand how we can work on ourselves and also be there for one another and also how to help one another be seen. I'm like, yes, so we needed this for sure. I think I like to touch on the book, like generally speaking, I thought it was such a good balance between academic and like researched things that you could really take from and a conversational tone, because I think sometimes that things tend to be more one than the other. And I felt like it really connected with me in a good balance, because every time I was thinking, well, you know, what is the the why behind this, it would pop up in a way that I could easily digest without having to, you know, look up a whole bunch of things, but still feel like I had learned something. So that wasn't from one particular chapter, but just throughout the book, I thought that it was a really good way of weaving it together. I definitely agree with you, Kia. From a therapist's perspective with the book, Dr. Joy definitely executed well the delivery of the jargon and the definitions of attachment theory, like she really broke it down. So like you say, the way it was digestible to where you didn't need a degree in psychology or counseling to be able to understand these theories and modalities and practices. I think to go back to your question, Elise, what was our favorite part? One of my favorite parts was where she broke down the attachment theory because a lot of people aren't aware of that. And how we attach in our relationships really plays a huge part in how we show up in our friendships. And even when she broke down and explained, I think it was Eric Erickson's kind of like the stages of development, that was well written and well highlighted as well. I think giving people more insight so you can get the understanding of, oh, my relationship started here and my relationship maybe with my younger sibling, I see that now being implemented in my adult relationships with my best friends or whatever. So you have to kind of understand the root and basis of friendship and relationships. That was one of my favorite parts. I really love that part, too, because I've read a bit about attachment theory, but it's always talked about in terms of romantic relationships. And so I think sometimes we can prioritize developing and growing in romantic relationships, but not in friendships. And so there's a level of introspection in the book that I really appreciate. In addition to the attachment theory, the questions that Dr. Joy wrote that I had to ask myself about how I'm operating in my friendships. I felt like that was really helpful. So I wasn't just reading to learn, but I was reading and processing a lot of things in the book to understand myself. And that was really helpful. So Naisha, earlier on, you brought up the S's of sisterhood. And I'd love for us all to touch on how do you receive and give sisterhood? And if you feel comfortable sharing experiences from your own friendships, I'd be delighted to hear them. So when I was reading that, I obviously felt seen that I don't be asking for help, (laughs) but thankfully I accepted help this weekend. And as I was going through my notes, I was like, okay, Naisha, you didn't want to take that moment of help, but you accepted it. I was literally walking to a Starbucks and it was a 12 minute walk, but a three minute drive. And I had just left an event and these two sisters, they saw me at the event. I was like, hey sis, you just want to ride? And it was hard for me to say yes. And I've done that to other people. You know, hey, come on, come on in the car, come get a ride. I wasn't paying no $10 for the Uber. So I was like, I'm just going to walk this 12 minutes. It's nothing for me. But she was like, come on, get in. And I felt no hesitation at all. I still, I felt nervous accepting help. No, not nervous for safety and nothing like that. But accepting help, I'm like, why? Like she's literally going down the block just like you. But I had to just support myself because you know it was hot my purse was heavy because I had my laptop in it and it felt good and then jumping into the support of course she supported me at that moment as I've done for other people in the same situation come on just get in the car we're going the same route I was just gonna say that I thought it was really helpful 
the whole idea of holding space and what that means. And I thought the fact that on page 93, that the three skills that are needed are active listening, freedom from distraction, and a spirit of curiosity. I thought that was really helpful to give people, myself included, bullet points on, you know, I had a friend and I'm in that stage right now where people's parents are aging and, you know, some of them are obviously dying. And so the idea of what that means to hold space for someone's grief has become very relevant. So that was a really good reminder for me. I think for me, the support is huge, especially now in this season that I'm in with just having a newborn baby. So being able to receive help is like, I have to be okay with like my friends reaching out to me and checking in on me instead of being like, why are you still texting me? Like I'm feeling annoyed with everybody asking how I'm doing or how I'm feeling or how the baby is doing. Being able to say, it's okay, people just want to check in on you. Like it's okay to be checked on because I'm always that one to check on everyone else. And so since I am so occupied, I'm unable to do that. Now people are checking in on me. It kind of feels a little weird, but I'm in a space to receive it. So I'm allowing myself to receive the support from my friends and them showing up for me like I show up for them. So that was a huge reminder for me when I read that part. For myself, when I was thinking about the four S's of sisterhood, one that I think a lot of people come to me for and that I give very freely is like the knowledge of self. If I see a job that my friend might be good for, I'm gonna send it. If I'm reading an article, I'm like, oh my goodness, I just thought of Avery. I'm gonna send it immediately. I'm really open to sharing my own experiences and like having my friends grow from them, but also just like, oh, at least what is it like to be vegan? Or like, where should I eat in X, Y, Z place? Like that's very easy for me. But what's really hard for me is like to allow myself to be soft around other people. I think because I support people in that way, I I don't know, I just get scared, to, I guess, supporting myself and like allowing people to see that softer side of me. People tell me I can present like a rougher, not a rougher, a tougher exterior. And so being more vulnerable with people around me, it can be like really scary, especially because I have a bigger family and I have like a lot of siblings. And sometimes I'm like, I don't need friends, but then I realize like I really do need my friends in the same way that they need me. I'm hearing a lot of descriptors of the folks in this conversation being the strong friend or the friend that does the reaching out, the friend who sends the resources. And it's making me think about how Dr. Joy broke down the different type of friends in a group. So she described the leader, the wallflower, the firecracker, or the peacemaker. And I'd love to hear from us all, which one are you? And you might be a different kind of friend in a different group. So if you could share what kind of friend you are, and then also give us a little bit of context for this group. Is it your high school girlfriends? Is it your friends that you met through your parents? Rita, I love how you distinguish the groups because that's the real thing when it comes to my high school friends, my college friends, my friends that I developed in motherhood, now my adult friends and then my coworker friends. Like it's it's important that you distinguish the group because each each group either you were a different version of yourself when it developed, right? And so for my high school friends, they might still see me as the firecracker in certain spaces. I'm the one that's gonna be like, I'm gonna say it. If it's weird, I'm gonna I'm gonna call the elephant out in the room because why y'all being weird? And some of my college friends will see that, too, because we went to high school together. So it's like an interchangeable role between that and the leader. My adult friends, college friends, grad school friends, motherhood friends, they will see more of the leader role of me. They don't necessarily see that firecracker because with age, I've toned it down, right? (laughs) In maturity in life. But my high school friends, when they see me in spaces with the other groups of friends, they're looking at me like, well... Who is that? Like, is this the gorgeous we know? Because normally you would have said this, or why are you acting scared? You're not going to say what you feel, you know what I mean? But it's just in the sense of, I'm still me, but I present different amongst different groups due to the relationship. I might feel a little bit more safer with my high school friends because of the longevity to be that firecracker, right? So it's about how safe you feel too and how you show up. It's interesting that you mentioned safety because... I feel safe when I'm not the only one being the leader in a friend group. And so I think 
because of the nature of like my job being a producer, you have to lead a lot. You have to organize a lot. And so when I find myself in situations where I'm the only one giving in that way, I get really nervous and I get overwhelmed because it's like, is this work? Like, I don't like that. And so I think sometimes in a friend group, I'm looking for like a collective of leaders. And I know like sometimes we can butt heads, but I hate feeling like I'm bearing the burden of like planning things or reaching out or like making sure everyone's being like really cohesive. But I will say outside of being the leader, I am the firecracker. So I'm a Gemini. I'm a Sagittarius rising. Like I'm not afraid to say it. <laughs> and I think, you know, sometimes I think when I was younger, especially with my college friends, that could cause like a lot of tension. And that's where I found myself being like the firecracker, but also being the peacemaker, like allowing everyone to say how they feel and being that person who can bring up difficult things, but also checking myself and like, I'm not bringing up this difficult thing for drama or to call somebody out or to have some tea. It's like, no, I'm bringing it up so we can resolve it and we can move forward as a friend group. And so I think naturally I'm a leader, but where I feel my safest is when I can be the firecracker, but also the peacemaker. When going through the descriptions, I'm like, I am a little bit of everything. And I was thinking about my family because I'm not around my family that often. It's particularly my father's side. And we're planning the family union. And I was supposed to take the lead on it. But apparently people didn't want to come to New York and they planned something in Florida. So right now I'm kind of being the wallflower and being a little quiet. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to still show up and be there, still be my firecracker self when I get there. I'm leading things when it comes to, hey, who's watching all the kids? Because the family reunion. Who's watching all the kids while the millennials go out to the club? I'll be leading that. And then when it comes to like serving our elders, I'm ready to make sure they're served and taken care of. When I was listening to Elise, when she was saying, you know, planning different things she produces, I am in the stage where I'm like looking forward to going to events, but I don't have to put things together. As you all know, I do this for the sister circle, but I just want to be quiet and enjoy the event and not plan the event. I'm looking forward to that. I am an entrepreneur who I have to take the lead and just go for it and just show myself that I can be the lead and it's okay. Gorgeous also mentioned something. As I get older, becoming more mature, and as a parent, I talk so much. I'm like, I just want to be quiet and be that wallflower and relax. I have noticed in all of my friend groups, I'm the leader and... I attribute that to, for talking astrology, I'm a cancer sun with a Leo moon. So trying to be very nurturing all the time and also boss lady energy. And so recently though, with one of my friend groups, the best way I can describe them is high school and post-college. I met half of them through my friends that I knew when I was younger. And so that's the group. And I was a leader in this group. And I noticed, to Elise's point, that I was the one always planning and coordinating our events. And I decided to take a sabbatical from this role, but I did not tell the group that I was doing that. And I noticed because I do it in every other category or in every other relationship that I have where I'm leading, I'm leading, I'm leading. I said, oh, if y'all want to be together, somebody else plan it. But I didn't tell them that. And so recently... We got on a call that I planned because I took a year off from planning with these people. So I planned my first event of this year and they said, oh, Frida, we miss this so much. You know, we we would really appreciate if you did this more. And it was the first time I said, "Okay, y'all, I'm happy to do this. But the next one, if you want this to happen, I need someone else to plan one. I need to see someone else take this up because the reason I stepped away from y'all is because no one else was doing anything. And they said, but you didn't tell us. You didn't tell us you were upset. And then you left us for a year and now we done missed out on a year of sisterhood. And I said, well, damn, you're right. So <laughs> so this book made me think of that. And also to the folks who identify as multiples, I realized I don't wanna be the leader in every group. I'm about to start being a wallflower in some groups. I'm gonna be a firecracker. You know, I need to diversify how I show up. Because I would notice I'm over indexing in this leader category. And as Elise said, as a producer, coordinating and scheduling every day. And as Naisha said, coordinating and scheduling for other people, I need to figure out other ways to show up and feel like that's enough. Because a lot of times I think if I'm not leading, if I'm not directing, people aren't going to have a good time or it's not going to happen. And allowing other people around me to rise to the occasion 
and do it their way without thinking that my way is better. More from the conversation after the break. So we touched on the essence of sisterhood, where we show up in our friendships. I'm curious, what else has the book taught you about friendship? One of the things that I felt like it really validated and put in really good terms for me is that I had started many years ago now thinking of my life concentrically and not as a pyramid where this is on top and everything else flows from it. I decided that they had to be circles, like it, it just was serving me better to have things not have this hierarchy. Like I said, to see that written out and really validated the choices that I've been making and made me feel like, yeah, this is this is putting into words what I have been trying to do, because especially I'm at a stage in my life obviously much different than you all where I'm about to have an empty nest my son graduates from high school my daughter's in college so and I feel like the decisions that I made when they were small are coming to blossom because I was like I cannot make them my everything they're the most important things in so many ways but there's got to be like I said the way I think I start thinking about it with circles that overlap intertwine and that there's no better or worse. There's no scale like that. They're all things that bring value to my life, my friends, my family, my, and not just my husband up here and the kids. It's, that's just, setting, to me, setting yourself up for not necessarily failure, but just not the richest life you can have. Kia, it's so fascinating that you came to this conclusion to implement this into your life. Was there a catalyst for this moment? How did you come to this understanding of the circles instead of the pyramid? Was there a moment that is distinguishable for you? No, I cannot say that there was any aha moment. It just became more and more apparent that, like I said, I come from a relatively patriarchal situation in terms of the very very typical head of household and not in a bad way but in a way that I was like, I'm going to learn from this. And I've been very fortunate that I have a partner who's very respectful of that and very supportive of that because I came to this conclusion with him and not because he was a certain way, but because this was a man who was like, the fullness and richness of your life is very important, whether or not we're together or not. So you need to do whatever is going to fertilize and help that bloom. It's so funny when Dr. Joy put in, she said she's going to say the most cliche thing that therapists say. (laughs) Everything starts with our earliest experiences. My goodness, this has come up in individual therapy, of course, and now recently group therapy, because I've been in group therapy for about four or five weeks. And we all agreed that, you know, our early experiences helps us understand why we're going through what we're going through now, why we're seeking growth in different areas. Me specifically, Asking for help was something that I did not grow up doing. My mom told me to figure it out. And collectively in group therapy, we said that a lot of family members told us that me specifically, a teacher, told me to figure it out. And I'm like, you're my teacher. Aren't you supposed to help me? Actually, she was one of my favorite high school teachers. But that was her way of telling us, use the internet now. You know, the internet was booming. And just be creative. And we didn't know how to ask those things back then. And I can say for myself, speaking to my mom, if she told me to figure it out, I had to go figure it out. So now being an adult, as you were mentioning, Frida, planning these things, rather than going to ask someone, I will spend 20 minutes on Google trying to find an answer. So now I'm getting like, no, Naisha, don't do this. I have, thankfully, I've made friends from the sister circle from Three for Thursday in Georgia specifically where I can ask questions when I need help. That's just a small example, but there's so many examples that I can share that my childhood just shaped who I am. And I'd love to touch on point as being a mom now, my childhood showed me what I don't want to show my child and how I want to be here for her. The other day, my five-year-old told her, her other mom, I can cry because my feelings are valid. And I said, yes, clap, 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 snap, 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 all that. (laughs) There was no debate. We said yes. And she said, all feelings are valid. And I'm like, did I tell her that? I think I did. If I didn't, I'm happy wherever she heard it from. It could have been YouTube, but I wasn't told that when I was younger. (laughs) I think that's really insightful. Like everything starts with like our previous experiences, our childhood experiences. And it reminds me on page 88 Dr. Joy writes about trying to figure out how your own stuff is interfering with being able to hold space for someone else. And I think 
that's one of the biggest things that this book kind of knocked me over the head with is like, everyone wants to be a great friend, but sometimes we have to realize when we're giving advice or when we're showing up for someone, how our past traumas, our experiences, our other relationships might be blocking or kind of blurring our vision. And one of the questions that she asked on that page is, is the situation my sister is confiding in me about too much like when I've experienced in the past? Am I really listening to her or am I replaying my own situation? And I found myself on both ends of that spectrum. So someone talking to me about something they're going through and me like feeling really triggered and like having a lot to say about it, but not backing up and realizing a lot of what I have to say is kind of based off of my own hurt and something I may have gone through and I may have experienced and I'm not really listening to her and like holding space for what's going on with her because I'm so clouded with my stuff. And so I think what you said, Naisha, really recognizing what you want to do differently in a situation when you're giving advice, but also realizing that like to really hold space for someone and for other people means that you kind of have to let go of your past hurt. And you can always be a friend from an informed place. But I really think a lot of times we get so wrapped up and so attached to our own hurts in the past that we're not able to really be there for other people. So I think that's something the book has really made me think about a lot. And I love this book because I think it's encouraging us to take our friendships just as seriously as we take our romantic relationships. And so a lot of those questions kind of prompt me to continue to do that. One thing this book has taught me and shared with me is a toolkit of language to have difficult conversations with people. And she, Dr. Joy broke it down for so many scenarios that I can anticipate having. So for me, I'm turning 30 this year and I'm at that place where people are going to start having more children more marriages. And then who, you know, for this thirties decade, there could also be divorce. There could also be parental loss. There's just going to be a lot of things that I anticipate is going to happen to and around the people that I love. And I just want to share one of them, which was, if you've noticed a change in your friends since your engagement or wedding, she writes, Hey, I just wanted to check in with you. It feels like something's been off ever since I got engaged slash married. I know this is a huge change for all of us. Is there anything you want to check in about? There was one for that. There was one about having a baby. If your friend is having a difficult time conceiving and you're really excited, but you know they're dealing with something. And at this place in my life and in reading this book, it affirmed for me that the friends that I have will be open to these kinds of conversations and that we can get through them and the power in that as opposed to what I may have done in my teens or in my 20s, which is just fade away. But in reading this book, I realized, oh, I'm going to need these friends throughout this decade, through the 40s, through the 50s, this strong sisterhood and having this language to identify these conversations. And as I, I think at least you pointed out a aspect of curiosity and almost like an optimism that this conversation is going to go well because I know my sister and I am proactively speaking about it. It just made me feel not like I'm excited to have these conversations because I'm not, but feeling empowered that I actually can navigate them well. I think you spoke a huge point, Frida, in that ability to navigate it well and being able to speak to it well, because I think that that's a common fear for a lot of people, right? Like, what do I say? I don't want them to think I'm jealous. I don't want them to think or feel no type of way. I don't want this to make our friendship, you know, change. So it's like having that optimism, I think definitely is a key factor and a key point. And I was going to speak to that part of the book too. That was the part I was going to highlight, but no, (laughs) you, you definitely hit the points that I was going to hit on. So yes, I agree with you on that one. And at a certain point, I know she says that the validation of change being okay, that sometimes you have to leave the people where they're at and that's okay. (laughs) And I think just having that, put out there and explicit terms was really helpful because, you know, you go back and forth about different things and there are certain situations that are not salvageable and that's okay. And you have to be at peace with the ending of it, that there's not necessarily going to be closure with it. And that's okay. And like I said, as somebody who's very solution oriented, like you tell me something, then I'm going to ask you a, B, C, D, that acceptance 
of things is something that I definitely have to be very conscious of because it's difficult for me. Kia, you brought up closure. And when Dr. Joy wrote, closure is not something other people give to you. I put the book down. I said, wow. Okay. (laughs) On that same note, there's an author called Cheryl Strayed. I'm pretty sure he said acceptance is a small quiet room. And I feel that so much because acceptance isn't this great big feeling. It's okay. You know, it's not a oversized emotion necessarily. It can be something very muted and only like you said, like closure. It's cousin, right? (laughs) Frida, when you mentioned that line, I'm just like, it was like a gotcha sis. Like you need to figure this out and not in the most, you know, common way. It doesn't come from the other person. And after being on three for Thursday with Dr. Joy for almost two years, she's brought this up many times that, you know, working on yourself will help you heal. If you're expecting it from the next person, then, you know, it's going to take a little longer. And these are not her exact words. That process is going to take a little longer than you expect. And it's just whew, that line. And I'm, I went back to it and I'm like, yeah, period. <laughs> she said it. <laughs> More from the conversation after the break. So for our next question, it kind of touches a little bit on what Frida mentioned earlier about approaching conflict in friendships. And she's talked about how she implemented that in some of her own friendship. So I'm curious, what have you guys taken from the book and how have you already started to implement it in your own friendships? I'll start. So similar to Frida, I really love the section about conflict. Because as I said before, I am the firecracker, but also the peacemaker. And I think I've always struggled. I've been good at being confrontational, but struggled to have like a soft and caring aspect to it. And so I really appreciated a lot of the prompts. I guess they take an approach that's not confrontational because Frida read the prompt about someone getting engaged and seeing their friend be distant. You could be like, you're being really shady ever since I got engaged. I don't like that. (laughs) Instead of realizing like, where is this other person operating from? They may be hurt. And so I think what the book has made me see are ways I can continue to exude softness, but also continue to approach conflict in a healthy way. And I think something I think about is back in 2020, I had a friend who I approached about just not a very similar situation, not hearing from her, especially during the pandemic, we lived around the corner from each other. We were only people in our city. And I remember I had a lot of pent up aggression about that situation, but something from like six months ago and then something from two weeks ago. And I was realizing I came to her and I was at level 10 and she didn't even know that something was wrong. And so I constantly think about also looking at my own past hurt and like what feelings with my friends haven't I resolved in approaching any conflict because like Naisha said, the past really does inform everything we do and how we operate in every relationship. And so if we're not taking the steps to address conflict as it's presented to us, we can have a lot of pent up aggression. So that softness and that care to our friendships can kind of be lost when we want to resolve conflict if we're not really checking in with ourselves. And then if we're not thinking about where is the other person on this scale? Have we talked about this before? Or is this like a new issue that I'm bringing up to them? And so the book has really helped me. I've started to be a lot more self-aware when approaching conflict, but who else? I'm curious. I think for me, just a reminder to be intentional and that to continue to cultivate new friendships, new relationships that it doesn't have to be static, that it doesn't mean that you're going to necessarily feel the same sense of kinship with people who you've known for decades. But the way to cultivate anything, like I said, is to be intentional about it and to really be open to continuing to be there for the Black women who I might encounter in more casual situations to be, like I said, really purposeful in cultivating relationships with them, which I think I have been, but just a reminder to go that extra mile because we are all we've got. I think for me, it definitely reminded me that my close friends don't live here in Atlanta, right? And so it's like, oh, you need to like find and put yourself back out there now, especially since things are a little bit more safer regarding the pandemic and meet more people. Like, granted, I know people, but I need to like spend time and engage 
it's like I haven't fully invested like I should. And so it was a huge reminder of like, if you want things to look different, you want that support to be more immediate and accessible to you instead of long distance, then I have to, you know, show up and really put forth effort. What you said, gorgeous, made me think about a song I learned in elementary school, and it was make new friends, but keep the old one is silver and the other is gold. I also, I love that song. I don't know if y'all learned that. It's a very California school song. Anyway, I also just moved to a new place. I'm in Washington, D.C., and realizing the same thing. I actually need to not be team no new friends. And if I want D.C. to be as wonderful and miraculous as other places I've lived, like New York City or the Bay Area, to be as fruitful and bountiful, I have to take that extra step and work on those relationships. I will also say this past weekend, I had the opportunity to go to Los Angeles to celebrate my friend's 30th birthday. And weeks leading up to it, I was very reluctant. I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to go and I just wasn't sure if I was going to, wanting to spend the money and do all those things. And then I think it affirmed for me that the right friends and the commitment to the right friends really just energizes me in a way I can't even describe. So spending one weekend with her makes me feel like I have the energy for March and April and May. It's just It was just that kind of experience and how real sisterhood, whether it's seven years old or whether, you know, it's just seven months old, really impacts my health. And I think that's also one key takeaway from the book. Black women make me feel healthier, safer, more able to be myself and to be in this world. And I had never thought of it like that. Even growing up, going back to what we were talking about, our experiences are shaped by our past. I remember elders in my community telling me things like, oh, you know, keep don't keep your friends too close or don't tell your friends about your money. Don't tell your friends about your man. And then one day I was like, do you have friends? <laughs> do you do you have friends? Because what you're telling me is to fear the black women that are around me. And granted, caution is necessary. Everyone cannot be trusted. But I am so deeply moved and poured into by black women. And so that's what this book reminded me of. It's just the power of friendship in a way that I had never thought about before. Dr. Joy actually mentioned that. I forget which chapter, but she said, you know, after that girl's trip and you feel full and you feel whole. Yes, it happened for you, Frida. And a reminder to respect and take some things from elders and to discard others, right? You have to figure out what to take and what to leave behind because I know the same is true, you know, in terms of generational things. I remember I was at a family wedding and a woman who I loved dearly and respected so much when she found out I was like excited to tell her, oh, I work with all black women. And she was like, how is that? And it just felt very like this is a black woman who I've known because she was like, because she was bringing her own previous experiences. And I was like, it is truly wonderful. And like I said, this is somebody who has always been very supportive of me and just so inspirational. So to hear her try to give me her hurt in some ways it was or color my experience with hers I felt just like I said it was very eye-opening to me so for our closing we'd love to hear why do you think this book is important to have in the library of another black woman why would another black woman want to have this book in her library I think it would be important because this book is something you can grow with in the sense of starting maybe what is young as 18 or young adulthood throughout the transition of adulthood, it grows with you. And you can always reference back depending on the chapter or phase you are in in life and how to navigate different relationships and situations. Every Black woman needs this book in their lives because, as Frida mentioned earlier, there's a toolkit on how to approach different conversations. And rather than going to someone who has not seen the research and done the research themselves, 
the toolkit is there. As well as if you want to be seen and if you want ideas on how to grow, Sisterhood Heals will definitely give that to you. I think the word decolonize is thrown around a lot, decolonize your fitness, decolonize different aspects, you know, of your life. But I don't think people necessarily know what that means or how to do it. And I think that this book really is a key towards how to take frameworks that weren't meant for us and really apply them in ways that can benefit us and allow us to grow. So like I said, I think that that's one of the buzzwords that you hear people talk a lot about, but to see ways in which you can heal but that are outside of the standard ways that we've been taught. I think Sisterhood Heals is important in another sister's bookshelf because a lot of life can feel like we're just winging it and I don't think our relationships have to feel that way. I think sometimes we talk a lot about friendships being natural and connections being natural and that's great and that's fine but to maintain and to grow it does take a lot of hard work and I don't think it's wrong to listen to a podcast episode there for black girls to read sisterhood heels or to go to a talk the sisterhood heels book tour and get your friendships together and really like check yourself and say how can i be a better friend how can i be a better sister and so i encourage everyone to buy the book to read the book to share a copy with a friend because friendship doesn't have to be hard it doesn't have to be this big secret or something that just happens and unfolds naturally like 30 40 year friendships really do take hard work and I know everyone wants that beautifully said by all of you by all of us sisterhood heals is available for purchase at all booksellers as of June 27 2023 it has been our honor to talk with you about this book and prayerfully we'll be able to do this again because this was just scratching the surface of the incredible work Dr. Joy has done to put this book together for all of us to enjoy and grow from so thank you all so much for joining us So as many of you may have been able to tell, I was not a part of the conversation the team had. And I'm so honored and touched by all of their takeaways and the stories they shared. A huge thank you to Kia, Gorgeous, Frida, Elise, and Naisha for letting us inside their book club. I would also be honored if you would take a moment to pre-order your copy of Sisterhood Heals right now, as pre-orders are incredibly important to the life of a book. They are what demonstrate that there is interest for a particular topic and really indicate to bookstores, publishing companies, etc. that you want more of a certain thing. Pre-orders let stores know how many books to have on hand, and I want as many sisters as possible to be able to find out about Sisterhood Heals. So please help me out by making your pre-order today at sisterhoodheals.com. And then text two of your girls to encourage them to grab it as well. If you're looking for a therapist in your area, check out our therapist directory at therapyforblackgirls.com slash directory. And if you want to continue digging into this topic or just be in community with other sisters, come on over and join us in the sister circle. It's our cozy corner of the internet designed just for black women. You can join us at 